Good morning and Merry Christmas once again. On this Sunday after Christmas, while, which the church designates as the Feast of the Holy Family, I want to talk about that family, the one formed when the Blessed Virgin Mary, the wife of St. Joseph, gave birth to the Son of God. But I would also like to talk in a kind of a broader sense about the state of the family in today's world. In 1982, around the time that Cardinal Carlo Caffara, acting on instructions from then Pope John Paul II, founded the Pontifical Institute for the Studies on Marriage and the Family in Rome. Cardinal Caffara received a letter from Sister Lucia of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart. Sister Lucia was Lucia dos Santos, one of the three children of Fatima who were the eyewitnesses of Our Lady's apparitions in Fatima in 1917. In her letter to Cardinal Caffara, Sister Lucia told of subsequent messages that she had received from the Blessed Mother, one of which was the following, quote, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. However, Our Lady has already crushed his head." End quote. Again, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. In that same letter, Sister Lucia wrote this, quote, in times such as the present, when the family often seems misunderstood in the form in which it was established by God and is assailed by doctrines that are erroneous and contrary to the purposes for which the divine creator instituted it, surely God wishes to address to us a reminder of the purpose for which he established the family in the world." End quote. The Catechism, following the lead of Lumen Gentium, which was the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on the church, calls the family the domestic church and the seedbed of faith, and for good reason. Here's how Lumen Gentium states it, quote, the family is, so to speak, the domestic church. In it, parents should, by their word and example, be the first preachers of the faith to their children, end quote. And so seen in that light, your family can and should be thought of as a tiny outpost of the kingdom of God, just as the church is the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God on the earth. St. John, Sec- John Paul II once wrote this, quote, on our path of life, we recall that among these many paths, the family is the first and most important. It is a path common to all, yet one which is the primary, fundamental, and unrepeatable community for man just as every individual is unrepeatable. It is a path from which man cannot withdraw. The mission of being the vital cell of society has been given to the family by God himself. St. Pope John Paul II also wrote the groundbreaking apostolic exhortation of 1981, entitled Familiaris Consortio, which has come to be known as the Magna Carta of the Apostolate of Families. He penned that document, that document for the express purpose of summarizing and reinvigorating the church's age-old teaching on the sanctity of marriage and the Christian family at a time when that reinvigoration is, is so sorely, sorely needed. Now, of course, we know it all began, family life all began in the Garden of Eden. When God wanted to populate the earth, he joined one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve, and he told them to increase and multiply, be fruitful, he said, and fill the earth. And so they began to have children. Later, 
When God purged the earth of sin in the great flood, he saved one family, that of Noah, who then had the responsibility of repopulating the earth. In fact, the earliest mention we have of the word family in the Bible relates to the descendants of Noah. In Genesis 10.5, we read that from the grandchildren of Noah, people were divided into families. When God called Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and move on to the land of Canaan, Abraham took his whole family with him. Ultimately, the 12 tribes of Israel sprang from the families produced by the 12 sons of Abraham's grandson, Jacob. And finally, when the fullness of time had come, the Word made flesh was born into a human family, the Holy Family. Today, children are raised and nurtured and brought up in the ways of the Lord in families, our families, and our extended families. You and I, by the way, even think of our parish as a kind of family, which it is. And in fact, in more than one place in his epistles, St. Paul makes reference to the family of God. When, as an example, in Ephesians chapter 3, he writes this, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in, earth, on, in heaven and on earth is named. Now, we know, especially at seasons like Christmas, that family relations elicit very strong emotions in us, don't they? Usually very positive ones, in some cases very negative ones. Now, I know you don't have to think much about that assertion to understand and agree that it's true. All of us have experienced them because no one loves you as deeply as your family does. And no one has the capacity to hurt you as deeply as family members sometimes can. In the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus taught about the father's acute sense of loss over his son who had left the family and was living away from the family in a degenerate lifestyle. And then Jesus tells us of the father's unrestrained joy at the young man's return but notice it's coupled with the older brother's bitter, jealous resentment at the way his father received back his younger brother. As I said, family relationships elicit very strong emotions. So in Galatians chapter 4, St. Paul writes this, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Notice the fullness of time. The incarnation is the consummation of the divine plan. It is the goal toward which the Godhead had been moving for all those countless centuries since the fall of man in the garden. Thus, Paul can say rightly, when the fullness of time had come. And what was it that God actually did at that point in time, in the fullness of time? Paul says he sent forth his son. Sent him forth where? To where and from where? And how did he do so? How did he send him forth? He sent him forth from his eternal pre-existent state in heaven into time and space and history, specifically into the earth at the dawn of the first millennium. And then here's the interesting part, the really important part. How did he do it? By having him conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin, a woman, a human mother. What an astonishing truth. You know, we say this, I mean, we talk about this all the time, don't we? I mean, this is the reason why we celebrate Christmas. But we talk about the incarnation all the time. And so, you know, sometimes because it's such a familiar concept, such a familiar story, that we have a tendency to sort of take this casually, but what an astonishing truth. When the almighty, eternal God of the universe wanted to accomplish the greatest rescue operation in history, 
namely the redemption of mankind, he sent his own son to become the son of a human mother and part of a human family. Can we just let that sink in for a second? The God who is bigger than anything we can imagine, in fact, who transcends all definitions of size and scope, began his life on earth as an embryo, then a baby who grew into manhood as a member of a family, nurtured, educated, and protected by a human couple, two human beings, a mother and a father. When I counsel couples who are preparing for marriage, one of the things I always talk with them about is the awesome privilege of procreation. Procreation, that God both allows and enables human beings to participate actively in the creation of another human being. Think about that. When sperm and egg meet, God is there, breathing an immortal soul into the fertilized ovum. And so the children that we are thus privileged to procreate will be the only products of our lives on earth that will last into eternity. The only products of our lives on earth that will last forever. Do you understand what a privilege that is? What an awesome privilege? Now, referring back again to Sister Lucia's letter to Cardinal Kafara, she wrote this, quote, God entrusted to the family the sacred mission of cooperating with him in the work of creation. Thus, the divine creator wished to entrust to the family a sacred mission that makes two human beings become one in union so close that it does not admit of separation. It is from this union that God wishes to produce other human beings. So again, God sent his own son to be born of a woman and the Holy Spirit, and he became one of us in all ways, all ways like us, except that he did not sin. And why? Why did he do that? So that we, you and I, might be adopted into the family of God by receiving the spirit of his own son into our lives, in baptism, in confirmation, through our life of faith, we receive the Spirit of, of His own Son into our lives. Adoption into the family of God. Sin had separated us from the Father. In other words, it had made us spiritual orphans. But the Father, in His love and mercy and grace, sent His only Son to become part of the human family and of a particular human family, the Holy Family, in order to rescue us from sin and death and Satan and to bring us back, back to the Father, back to the family. That, brothers and sisters, should give you some idea of how close to the heart of God is the whole concept of family. And so back to my opening observation. Sister Lucia said that Mary's words to her were, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Is there anyone here today who doubts that you and I are seeing evidence of that battle for our marriages and families? being waged all around us every day in the culture in which we find ourselves? The sexual revolution of the 1960s, a movement, by the way, that in reality began long before 1960, has in our day reached final fruition and in fact has gone to seed it manifests itself in a whole array of rampant moral aberrations, adultery, cohabitation, widespread divorce, 
contraception, abortion, infanticide, fatherlessness, pornography, same-sex marriage, transgenderism, pedophilia, sex trafficking, and on and on. When I read that laundry list, I feel like taking a shower. All of those things that I just mentioned, every one of them are fronts in the war against marriage and the family, which Our Lady of Fatima spoke of to Sister Lucia. Satan is now, I believe, at this very moment, overplaying his hand in this war. By that I mean he's becoming eminently obvious in what he's doing. And so we must not be ignorant of the signs that are all around us. You're probably aware that one of the neo-Marxist organizations that were wreaking so much havoc and rioting, looting, and burning in America's cities this past summer, one of those organizations has as one of its openly stated objectives the destruction of the nuclear family. Think about that. Can you imagine that? An organization who has as its avowed and stated purpose the destruction of the nuclear family. The nuclear family meaning father, mother, children. I believe Satan is even using the pandemic in his all-out assault on the family. Why do I say that? Consider the urging of public health officials not to gather with your family on Thanksgiving or Christmas. Consider the hundreds of thousands of people who have died alone in hospitals, either of COVID or other causes, without the comforting presence of family members. Husbands without their wives, wives without their husbands, parents without their children, and so forth. Consider the thousands of small family-owned businesses that have been forced to close their doors forever. Consider the weeks and months we were not permitted to bring our families to church and to the sacraments. Now, I'm not by any means saying that those who enforce such restrictions are to blame. What I am saying, rather, is that Satan is strategically exploiting this situation for his own anti-family agenda. And I think we need to understand that. We need to recognize it. St. Uh, John Paul II wrote this in the early pages of Familiaris Consortio, quote, at a moment in history in which the family is the object of numerous forces that seek to destroy it or in some way deform it, and aware that the well-being of society and her own good are intimately tied to the good of the family, the church perceives in a more urgent and compelling way her mission of proclaiming to all people the plan of God for marriage and the family, ensuring their full vitality and human and Christian development, and thus contributing to the renewal of society and the people of God. And so what do we do? What is our response to all of this? I believe Almighty God, by His Spirit, wants to challenge every one of us on this Feast of the Holy Family to recognize how critically important the survival and well-being of the family and of your family, how, how critically important that is in the plan and will of God. What I'm saying to you is, don't just listen to this homily in the abstract. Do something about it. Understand that this is about your family. 
It's about all families, but more personally, it's about your family. Rejoice over what God has done for us in and through his holy family by adopting us back into the family of God. And then resolve to do all in your power to nurture, protect, and encourage the family as it comes under the ever more vicious assaults of the evil one and of a depraved culture. Recognize the war we are in and be willing to be a soldier in this battle. Stand for the truth in love Yes, in love, but stand for the truth at all times, no matter who is standing for the lie. Let me say that again. Stand for the truth in love at all times, no matter who is standing for the lie. And do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The stakes are high because the reward of eternal life is high. Let's agree that with the help of the Spirit of the living God, along with the Queen of Heaven, the ultimate victory for marriage and the family will be well worth the battle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.